Hello, good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of Oxford Sports Live. Uh, we're running a little bit late because of technical difficulties, but thanks for keeping with us. Um, today we're talking about everything to do with uh, the gut, bacteria and the brain and our behaviour. And we're joined uh, with Katerina Johnson, a doctoral student here at the University of Oxford based in the Department of Psychiatry and Psychology. So, without further ado, let's get into it. So, what, what are we talking about? Can you give us a bit of an overview today? Yeah, sure. So, um, you might not be quite who you think you are. Um, and roughly speaking, we're actually half human and half bacteria. Um, but the most recent estimates actually suggest that the number of uh, human and bacterial cells in our bodies is so similar that basically, before you go to the toilet, you're more bacteria than human. Um, and then after you've, uh, how should I put this, um, cleared your gut contents, you're more uh, human than bacteria. And so it's kind of cool that we have this almost like daily fluctuation between being more bacteria and more human. Um, and the majority of these guys live in our guts. So our guts house over 100 trillion microorganisms. Um, and just to put that into perspective, uh, that's actually more than the total number of stars in the whole of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and together, our body's microbes weigh approximately three pounds, which is actually roughly equal to the weight of our own brains. Um, and that's kind of a nice coincidence because my own research actually looks at how the types of bacteria living in the gut um, may affect the brain and behavior and whether they may even influence things like our personality. Wow, okay, so these teeny tiny little things living in our guts are, are affecting our behavior. So what evidence is there to link you know, these gut bacteria and, and our behavior? Yeah, so some listeners might be a bit dubious right now, um, but let me convince you, there is actually some pretty cool science behind that gut feeling. Um, I mean, as you might imagine, um, experiments aren't really easily done in humans, and so studies often involve uh, lab mice, and you can get different strains of mice, so some strains are naturally quite uh, bold and aggressive, and other strains are kind of more shy and timid. Um, and one of the first really convincing studies, uh, done quite a few years ago now by some researchers, found that if you take all the gut bacteria from an aggressive mouse and all the gut bacteria from a shy mouse and you basically uh, swap the contents of their gut, um, then the temperament of the mouse actually becomes more like the individual from whom it received the gut bacteria. Um, and so this was a really key study that suggested that you know, maybe our gut microbes may influence how we behave. Um, but this wasn't just a fluke, and so more recently there have actually been quite a few follow-up studies, um, and people have taken gut bacteria from humans that are depressed, um, and if you colonise the guts of mice with these bacteria, um, it kind of you know, makes the mice upset, but not if they're colonised with bacteria from humans that aren't depressed. You know, obviously it's kind of hard to tell you know, what's going on inside the mind of a mouse, um, but researchers can use sort of uh, standard behavioural tests to see how the animals respond to certain tasks and this allows them to assess the kind of so-called depressive-like symptoms um, that the animals show. Um, there are also other interesting links as well. So for example, um, some research uses specially bred mice and they're actually born and they live their whole lives with no bacteria in them at all. Um, and uh, they're called um, germ-free mice. Um, and it's obviously kind of an extreme uh, situation that you wouldn't find in nature. But you actually find that in these animals they show impaired social uh, communication and poor social behaviour. Um, and some studies find that you can actually rescue these deficits by uh, feeding them with um, sometimes just one particular type of bacteria. Um, and that's often uh, lactobacillus, which you might have heard of because you see it sometimes in the ingredients of things like probiotic yoghurts. Um, and this whole field is... Uh, so kind of relevant to understanding conditions like autism, uh, which is characterised not only by you know, deficits in social behaviour, um, but also uh, people commonly suffer from digestive issues as well. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, forgot to say, but if you have any questions about this, which is entirely fascinating, then do leave them by writing them in the comments below. Um, so anyway, we've got these bacteria in our guts and our brains are up in our head. Uh, so how, what language are these bacteria talking in? Like how, how do they communicate with the brain? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's something that we're really still grappling with at the moment. Um, so we know that there's a main nerve that communicates from the gut to the brain called the vagus nerve. And some studies show that um, this nerve is really important in enabling our gut bacteria to affect our brain chemistry. But then other studies find that this nerve doesn't um, always seem to play a role. Um, and actually, there's more and more evidence now for uh, an important role played by our immune system. 
So we know that bacteria in the gut are really important for regulating our immune response, and so basically how our body deals with potentially uh, bad bacteria and infection. Um, and in turn, uh, the state of our immune system has been like increasingly uh, linked to our psychological well-being and our mood. And so we think that maybe gut bacteria may affect the brain um, by tweaking um, our immune response. Um, although another really intriguing idea actually is that um, gut bacteria can actually produce chemicals of identical structure to our brain's own neurotransmitters. Um, and um, so neurotransmitters are the chemicals that our brains make to send signals between nerves. So you might have heard of things like serotonin, which is a happy chemical, um, or dopamine, which is responsible for feelings of uh, pleasure and reward. Um, but the thing is, at the moment, we're not sure how relevant this is. So even if gut bacteria produce neuroactive chemicals in our gut, um, can they affect our brain? Um, maybe, for example, by triggering the nerve that goes from our gut to our brain, um, or perhaps uh, through other means like traveling via the bloodstream. Um, but we're not sure at the moment. Um, and there's another mechanism that could be uh, uh, playing a part as well, uh, which is when bacteria uh, break down our food, um, they produce numerous waste products. Mm -hmm. And some of these waste products, like fatty acids, are actually well known for their beneficial effects on the brain. Wow, okay. Um, and do we know or have any sp speculative theories as to why those bacteria would have neuroactive, create neuroactive chemicals at all? Uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, we like to think of them as neurotransmitters because that's the function that these chemicals play in our own bodies and brains. Um, but in reality, uh, these chemicals actually have very uh, evolution-conserved functions. So they function for like cell signaling. So they're found not only in bacteria, but also in things like uh, fungi um, as well. And there, there is a hypothesis, although we're not sure at the moment, but one reason why we might be able to produce these uh, neurotransmitters is actually... Um, 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 during evolution, maybe the genes in bacteria that um, make these chemicals actually transferred into our own genomes, and that's why we might be able to synthesize these neurotransmitters. But yeah, that's, that's still a theory at the moment. It's uh, definitely food for thought to think, you know, what came first, <laughs> or why our brains create those anyway. Um, great, so uh, we're talking about the, the microbiome, this is a word, uh, and why it's important, but, but what actually is it? We've used that word. What is the microbiome and, and why is it important? Yeah, so um, the microbiome is just a term that we use to describe a collection of microorganisms living in any particular environment. Um, and it includes not only bacteria, but also uh, things like viruses and, and fungi. Um, and the majority of research um, at the moment is on the gut microbiome because this houses nearly all of our body's microbes. Um, but, you know, microorganisms, you can't put anything past them. You know, they can colonize pretty much any surface of the human body. Um, and so um, there are other interesting areas of research as well, like the skin microbiome um, and the oral microbiome. Um, you know, and I guess fundamentally, you know, why is our microbiome important? As animals, we've evolved in this microbial world. And so now a lot of studies are, are really revealing that our microbial companions uh, play key um, role in uh, you know, our body's development and our physiology, you know, not only in helping us with things like digestion, but there's actually um, specific vitamins that we ourselves can't produce, but only our gut bacteria can make them. I mean, and they also play roles in uh, regulating our metabolism and our immune system, and like my own research looks at, maybe even um, affecting your behavior. Um, and I think this is kind of in such stark contrast to the antibiotic era where um, you know, bacteria were seen as largely causing disease and something that you know, we'd want to eliminate. But now we're realizing that that completely definitely isn't the case. We could all be a little bit more dirty, perhaps. Anyway, so um, it sounds like if our microbiome can affect us, can we change our microbiome with our diet today? Yeah, so I'm sure that's a question that a lot of people are, are wondering. Um, we actually have amazing diversity between us in our gut microbiome. So if you look from one person to the next, um, we only share roughly 20% of species. And our own individual uh, gut microbiomes are actually very stable. So if uh, you suddenly change your diet for a few days, um, or say you have an upset stomach, it will quickly actually go back to what it was like before. Um, although having said that, there are certain diets uh, that are associated with different types of bacteria. You know, so for example, if you have a diet that's high in fiber, it will likely have a high abundance of um, bacteria that specialize in breaking down fiber. Um, and also, when I talk about my research, people often ask me um, whether I take probiotics. So probiotics are these lives from so-called good bacteria that are added to foods like yogurts. 
Um, but the thing is that the um, strains of bacteria um, in these products aren't actually identical to the strains that commonly occur in our guts. Um, and also, you know, if you're healthy and you haven't taken like um, antibiotics or anything recently, um, most studies seem to suggest that um, it's very hard for these uh, probiotic bacteria to um, actually colonize the gut because our guts are um, teeming with so many bacteria already. Um, although the jury is still out on whether there may be some specific uh, benefits to, to having probiotics. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because if you look across the foods of many cultures, a lot of them actually incorporate natural, like, probiotics into their diets. So fermented food, like cheese um, and sauerkraut, and also Asian dishes like kimchi um, and miso soup. And so maybe kind of from an evolution perspective, these foods are known to be good for us, and that's why they've been, like, passed through um, the generations. Um, but my lab also looks at something called prebiotics. And, and this is rather than consuming bacteria, you actually consume a particular type of fiber that preferentially promotes the growth of kind of good gut bacteria like lactobacillus um, and bifidobacterium. Um, and they've been linked to um, good health in general, but also there are some studies in animals suggesting that they may help um, alleviate anxiety and depressive like symptoms and improve social behavior. But obviously those studies have largely been done in animals so far. Um, and, the, and this type of prebiotic fiber is also found to occur naturally in foods. Um, so if you want to boost your um, gut bacteria, you can eat things like asparagus, banana, chicory, onion, um, garlic, and that kind of stuff. Cool. I think we'll all be heading out to the shops. Um, so I suppose it, it sort of poses a question of, um, you know, where do, if, if our bacteria are different between different individuals and so on, and we can change it a little bit, but it goes back to normal, um, where, where does it come from? Is it from our mums? Yeah, so, um, well, we used to think that the womb was sterile, um, and that's kind of, uh, but that, even that's changing a bit, so we're not even sure if the womb is sterile. But, but um, traditionally, we think that um, we're colonized with bacteria um, when we pass through the vaginal canal, when we're born, basically, and um, so we're colonized with the gut microbes largely from our mother. And so this is why there's been quite a lot of research in the moment looking at cesarean sections, um, because I know in, in, in countries like America, there's up to 30% of births are through, through cesarean sections. And some studies find that um, in babies born by cesarean section, rather than being colonized by um, kind of their mother's vaginal microbiome, instead they tend to be colonized by bacteria that you would find on like hospital equipment or on the skin microbiome. And so we don't know whether this is kind of um, an issue because especially when you're young, um, it's very important to be colonized by the um, kind of right uh, bacterial communities that teach our immune system what, what, what types of bacteria that are potentially bad and to, to react to and what types of bacteria are kind of friendly. And so there is some thought in the field that uh, this increase in cesarean section may be linked to kind of the rise in things like autoimmune conditions. Um, but at the moment, you know, it's still kind of a, a quite a new area of research. So we don't even have um, a sort of observational, correlational study with C-section equals bad in the longer term versus there's... Cause so, someone has actually asked a question about uh, C-section versus, um, you know, natural birth. Yeah, so I mean, the good news is that uh, quite a few studies, when they look at adults, they find that there isn't any difference in the gut microbiome between those that are born by cesarean section and those that aren't. Um, and even, not even adults, so even once you're like a few years old, the signature seems to disappear. Um, but, but, but we don't know for sure whether um, it could have like an effect um, on your immune system more long term because it's when you're young and when your immune system is developing that this really seems to be key to your health. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still, a, it's still a, um, a really active area of research at the moment. Great. Um, we also had another question in from someone watching online um, about does sport affect our microbiome? Yeah, good question. Um, there hasn't been that much research looking at, looking at whether sport affects the microbiome, um, but there are a few papers that suggest that it, it generally is linked to um, uh, more healthy microbial communities, so particularly bacteria that perhaps have like anti-inflammatory effects. Um, but in a lot of these studies, it's kind of hard to tease apart whether you know, people might just tend to have a more healthy microbiome you know, and be sporty at the same time. Um, but there are studies that seem to suggest that, yeah, um, sport, like, like everything else, seems to be good at, um, at having a beneficial effect on the microbiome. And uh, we've possibly seen things in the news and stuff about other ways that people are perhaps changing their microbiome 
such as a fecal or poo transplant. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. Yeah, how can, you, how can you talk about the microbiome without escaping poo transplants? Um, yeah, so actually, um, they're, they're, they're not um, standard procedures in some countries, but they are, um, they, 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 they are carried out in the UK. And um, they tend to be carried out for people that have um, recurrent or um, uh, C. difficile, so Clostridium difficile infections. Um, and so basically they just take all your gut bacteria and uh, they, they give you somebody else's gut bacteria that that's kind of doesn't have this infection. And it's actually a really remarkably effective treatment. So in medicine it's 90% effective and usually in, in terms of medical treatments that's kind of unheard of. Um, and so obviously at the moment it's kind of a last resort. And there, there are questions I think we need to think about. So there's a lot of like... Uh, regulatory questions as well, you know, because we don't really know everything that's in, you know, our fecal matter. Um, we know that there's trillions of, you know, viruses and, and bacteria and fungi, you know, and if you think about things like blood transplants, people used to do that before we knew about things like HIV and screening for that. And so, you know, it might be a similar thing that we, we should really think about in terms of regulation. But at the moment, you know, people tend to do it only for um, extreme medical conditions and it's kind of a last resort and it seems to be really helpful but you could potentially imagine a future where people might be wanting to kind of perhaps even use fecal transplants to you know you know maybe um, improve their metabolism or or that kind of thing because there's some evidence that it may help for things like obesity as well but it's very uh, new research that's largely been done in um, animal models. Yeah um, and you mentioned fungi there we had a question about whether candida affects uh, mood or, or anything really, do you know? Um, I mean, uh, I don't know, it's, it's tricky, because uh, a lot of research at the moment is, is really based on looking at bacteria. Um, but um, yeah, people are starting to look at our fungal communities as well, because they might be just as important, really, um, and, and also play a role. So yeah, I can't answer that at the moment. I don't think anyone could, but yeah, there's an interesting question. Keep your eyes peeled, I guess, on that one. Um, someone's asking about twins, microbiome in twins. Can it be different? Yeah, so there have been some t uh, twin studies, and, and I, they did show, I think, that the microbiome was roughly 40% uh, or something heritable, I think. Um, but, uh, yeah, so this is one of the, the key questions, because we know that our genetics plays a role in our gut microbiome community. But even then, it, it doesn't seem to um, play a, a really uh, massive role. And a lot of evidence suggests that our environment and things like our diet and maybe even you know, how much we interact socially with one another and the environment and a lot of you know, whether we take antibiotics and this kind of thing can, can really uh, play a big factor in explaining differences in our microbiome. And that's one of the key questions, actually, because it's so extraordinary how diverse our gut microbiomes are between people. And a lot of this diversity we can't explain. You know, so at the moment, we don't really know what a healthy you know, microbiome looks like. We know that there's some bacteria that are really bad for us. And you know, a lot of bacteria seem to, seem to have some helpful roles. But yeah, it, it's still, there's still uh, loads of unanswered questions. Um, and I'm sure lots of you will be asking questions, but um, you, so you mentioned about your research is, is looking at behaviour and, and mood and things like that in particular. Um, can, we, can we just finish off maybe just telling us a little bit about what you're doing and how you're doing it and, and what you hope? Because it sounds fascinating, absolutely fascinating, very live field. Um, but yeah, just finish up on that. Yeah, so um, part of my own research is actually looking at personality traits in humans. So things like how sociable we are and our tendency to um, get anxious and stressed and whether that might be related to differences in both the composition and diversity um, of our gut microbiome. Um, and I've also done um, some studies in a, in a world uh, monkey population as well, um, and also uh, some studies on animals. And I think ultimately working in this field has really exciting potential to translate our findings to the clinic. Um, because there are some initial studies in animals that suggest that actually changing our gut microbiome may be as effective a treatment, if not more so, compared with commonly prescribed antidepressant drugs. Um, and also, um, you know, the potential to develop uh, therapies for things like autism, um, you know, where people suffer from social deficits, but often typically digestive issues as well. And so now researchers are increasingly interested in whether these symptoms are more intrinsically linked through our microbiome. Wow, this is amazingly interesting. I wish we could talk about this all day, but sadly we're going to have to bring this to a close now. Um, so I think everyone's going to be keeping their eyes peeled on what's going on in this field for the future and things like that. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Katerina, also. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, we'll see you next time.